Anthony Usher. Thief, usurer, merchant of flesh. Bernard Usher, swindler, forger, jewel thief, drug addict. Francis Usher, professional assassin. Vivian Usher, blackmailer, harlot, murderess. She died in the madhouse. Captain David Usher, smuggler, slave trader, mass murderer. Mr. Usher, I don't see that this has anything to do with Madeline and myself. I don't believe in the sins of the, the fathers being visited upon the children. Do not, sir. The house of Usher seems to you then normal. The house, sir, is neither normal nor abnormal. It is only a house. You are very wrong, Mr. Winthrop. This house is centuries old. It was brought here from England. And with it, every evil rooted in its stones. You really believe this? Evil is not just a word. It is a reality. Like any living thing, it can be created and was created by these people. The history of the Ushers is a history of savage degradations. First in England and then in New England. And always in this house. Always in this house. Paul of evil which fills it is no illusion. For hundreds of years, Foul thoughts and foul deeds have been committed within its walls. The house itself is evil now. Hello and welcome to Book vs. Movie. This is a podcast where we read books that have been adapted into movies and then we try to decide which we like better, the book or the movie. I am Margot P. of ColoniaBook.com and this is my good friend and co-host, Margot D. of Brooklyn Fitchick. Hi everyone. We are all the way halfway through spooky month. Oh, I'm so glad it's October. Yeah. <laughs> I am so delighted that it's. I put up my Halloween tree yesterday, finally. I've been so busy. I haven't had a second to... I've been wanting to, to get that thing up in the living room since like September 30th. <laughs> but um, finally got around to it yesterday. And things are... things are. We had an eclipse Yes. Could you see it where you were? Oh, yes. Yeah. I took a, um, I took a, uh, what do you call that? A colander, Mm -hmm. you know, a strainer that you strain the pasta through that's got the little circles in it. And we we looked at the sun through that and it made like little crescents (gasps) on the sidewalk. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, we were some hurricane or something. Yeah, we had a tropical storm yesterday. So there was no cloudy. Too cloudy. Oh, no. Yeah, no, here it was nice and sunny. And, um, and yeah, and the sun is like a weird, it has like a weird quality to the, anyway, it was very autumnal and it was wonderful. Um, and we have, speaking of autumnal, mm-hmm. oh my goodness, uh, we have a very, very fun episode to get to today. During October, we always do spooky um, books and movies. And, um, but it, but actually, you know, this is this is a short story that we're talking about today because every single week we try to do a brand new episode. That means we can't always do a whole giant novel every week. Uh, we have to kind of plan it out a little bit because we're busy people. And um, so we we a long time ago decided that we would consider any film that's been adapted from any kind of literary source as long as it has a literary source. We will consider it as long as people can get their hands on it, get their eyeballs on that movie um, streaming somewhere. We will definitely um, put it on the list. Think about doing it. And we are constantly looking for suggestions. Um, we have holiday season coming up. We've, we're have we coming up on 10 years. If you're just joining us because you you enjoy uh, Mr. Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, we've been at this for a super long time and specific, I think spooky movies is the first one that we did like as a theme month. So mm-hmm. we've had, I think maybe more of that than anything, but we do have the holidays coming up and we've done just about every holiday. I got to say, I'm kind of out of ideas. <laughs> I'm a little bit out of ideas. 
So if you and we have in our Facebook group, um, which we strongly recommend you join because we would love to have you there. Um, one of our listeners, Thaddeus, very kindly put a list of all of our movies that we've ever done. Um, so you can see if there's a movie that you are would wondering if we've covered it, and you can see if it's there. And if not, for heaven's sake, please tell us about it. We would love to do it. So there's a few places like that where you can interact with us, but that's probably the best one. Um, yeah, join us on the internet. Meet other listeners of this podcast, and and we would love to have you. We have a basic Facebook page, but like Margot said, it's our face, private Facebook group. That's what you have to join if you want to give us the suggestions on Facebook. We just talk about books and movies there and movie stars and stuff like that. So it's a really nice safe space to be on Facebook. We're on Twitter at an Instagram threads. All those places is at book versus a movie. And those you spell all those words out. And we have an old timey email book versus movie podcast. Spell that all out at gmail.com. And if you would like some stickers, we got a stack of stickers. Uh, just give us your address and we will drop them in the mail for you. I was just thinking about... Um in terms of speaking of holiday and speaking of songs, uh, did you watch, did you watch the, um, the Dolly Parton Christmas extravaganza Christmas on the square? Oh, yes. We, we might, I think that song predates that movie. We might, so that might be, there's something. a couple. I was thinking of eight yeah. crazy nights speak with Adam Sandler. Oh yeah. Cause he had the Hanukkah, that, song. Yeah. the Hanukkah song. Yeah. Okay. Grandma yeah. cut, got run over by a reindeer. That one was a, t- that became was a movie. Animated, right? <laughs> it was an I mean, we just, <laughs> just see, send us your ideas, of, please. <laughs> we, all the ones that you're thinking of, we have probably already done. And we, so please, please send us some ideas. <laughs> and, Look, if you really enjoy the show and you would like to help keep us in books and movies, you can you can support us on Patreon as well. Yes, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. We have a couple of very affordable options. It just helps us with getting the books and the movies and also for the costs of putting together the show. Recently, we put on our Patreon page. What we've also done, by the way, is that we've decided to put two years worth of shows in the basic free feed and all the holiday shows are free. But we have like Silence of the Lambs, Psycho, uh, Top Gun, believe it or not, uh, Urban Cowboy, all of these are in on our Patreon page. We've covered them in the past and people really enjoy those. So if you want to support us, that's a great place to do it. If money is tight, we totally understand. If you could just, wherever you get your podcast, please subscribe. And if you could leave us a few stars or a review, whatever they ask you to do, that would be amazing. We want to thank Good Pods. We've been doing very well on the Good Pods app and we were like very highly rated there for independent podcast, book podcasts, which is very exciting to us because we are an independent book co- podcast. Yeah, we really are. Uh-huh. Turns out yeah. we, we, we've been that this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> right from our rooms. <laughs> no studios. <Pretty> much. <laughs> um, now, look, today we're talking. I, was it last year that we did? The Raven? Was it last year the way we did The Raven? It was not that long ago. Right. No, it's, it's not that recently. long ago. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about Edgar Allan Poe before, but he's so much fun to talk about. Um, we're talking today, about, we, as I said a minute ago, we, t- we did the Raven a while back, um, uh, recently and, um, and we covered the Roger Corman, um, yes. Vincent, Pro- which is a scream. It is, it's worth watching. Mm-hmm. Give it, give it a watch. It has nothing to do with the poem whatsoever. Really? Not really. Um, but it's great fun. It's very campy. Uh, Roger Corman did a series. I didn't realize it was quite so many. It's like eight movies based on the works of Edgar Allan Poe, or as I should say, inspired by the works of Edgar Allan Poe. And um, the one that we're talking about today is actually the first one. So we're going to be talking about The Fall of the House of Usher. If you're looking for the movie... And we do recommend that you do. If you're looking for the movie, you will you may find it under just House of Usher. Sometimes it's listed as that. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's listed as Fall of the House of Usher. If you came to this podcast uh, hoping to hear us talk about the Netflix series, sorry about that. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> <laughs> Although there is some, well, we'll, we'll get into it. But, but let's, let's do just like, if we could just hit some of the broad strokes about Mr. Edgar Allan Poe, because... Um, first of all, he would so hate, I think, that we call him Edgar Allen, that we use the word, the name Allen mm-hmm. um, in his name. Ed, let's talk about Eddie Poe. 
Edgar Allan Poe was born 1809 to Elizabeth Arnold Poe. She was an actress and David Poe Jr., an actor. It makes a lot of sense because he's very theatrical throughout his life. Uh, His mother died uh, just a few couple of years after he was born, and he was taken to the home of John Allen and his, wrote, written down here, childless wife. They couldn't have kids of their own, so they took him in, and they gave, did the best they could by him. They gave him a, a good education. He, we went to a private school, and he learned about manners and reading and art. He was very artistic. He loved to draw. He loved to read. He loved to act. He was, like I said, very theatrical. And that sometimes clashed with his adopted father, who was a textile merchant and a little more rough and tumble and didn't kind of. And Edgar, just from a young age, had a lot of confidence, let's just say, in himself and in his abilities and how he interacted yeah. with people. He just was very smart and knew it. He reminds me a lot. Um, and it's funny, it didn't strike me so much the last time that we talked about it, but the, something about reading about him this time reminded me a bit of of um, Truman Capote. Yes. You know, he's got this, uh, not a stepfather in this case, but a, but a, like a foster, foster dad, foster parents um, who have taken him in. And, and so it's a weird relationship that he has with this, um, especially the father, the, the foster mm-hmm. father, Mr. Allen. Um, and as I said, like they, they had a lot of, it was good and bad. Like they wanted the Allens wanted children. I think they wanted somebody to like help run the bus- the business and um, perhaps even take it over one day. Unfortunately, they ended up with artistic, sensitive uh, Eddie Poe <laughs> um, instead, who not really cut out for the world of um, you know being a merchant businessman. <laughs> Retail was but, not going to be his thing. No. <laughs> but Alan, like Alan, did this. Did he helped him? But he also didn't help him. Like he would get him into a fancy school, but then not pay for books or clothes or any of the stuff that Ellen would need to succeed at the school. So it's a, it's a, I can, it sounds to me like it was a, just a very kind of fraught relationship. And, and I learned also recently that that famous photo that we all know where he just looks so unhappy and he's wearing that, what looks, you know, it's black and white. So it, what looks to be a black suit, but it is in fact a black it is, in fact, a funeral suit. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a suit that his foster father, it seems like, rather begrudgingly purchased for him to wear, to, I think, to the funeral of his foster mother. Right. And she loved so, him very much. Right? She loved him very much. And she dies. And um, and the dad, like I said, doesn't doesn't give Ed, Edgar any money to... Uh, like kind of sets him up for failure, I guess is what I'm saying, you know, mm-hmm. sends it like, here's, here's, I got you into this fancy school, but then, like I said, doesn't pay for anything, doesn't pay for food or clothes or books or anything that you like that, that extra piece. But when his uh, wife dies, he realizes that for, it looks bad for his foster son to like show up in rags. So he buys Edgar Allan Poe a suit. And so when Edgar Allan Poe, although this photo was not taken at that time, um, Edgar gets his photo taken, you know, of course you dress up. So he dresses up in the only real suit that he has, which is this funeral suit. And thus we all think of him as this Gothic mopey, um, emo. Emo is a good (laughs) word. (laughs) Uh, Which is so sad because like, he's literally wearing the best thing he could possibly wear for the, for the photo. Um, but yeah, so I think he rather the fact that we call him Edgar Allan Poe, unfortunately, is due to um, some of his literary enemies, which we'll we'll get to in a minute. But yeah, so he's he's a very from very early on, he's a very talented, um, sensitive uh, boy who is is obviously very gifted at writing and and driven to be a writer. And an artist, he apparently, he went to the University of Virginia. He then went to West Point. They say that what he would do is, you know, and I know people like this, like he would draw on the walls of his room. And kids didn't know if he was going to be an artist or a writer. And he would read Shakespeare. He would read his own work. He was very dramatic. He, he put on a show. I loved a movie. I don't know if you saw it last year. It's called The Pale Blue Eye. And it was with Christian... Um, Oh, geez, I'm forgetting his last name. The uh, Batman Christian. Christian Bale. Thank you. Christian Bale 
Harry Melling plays Edgar Allan Poe in the movie, and it's one of the best performances I've ever seen in my life. It's just fascinating, and it kind of brought up Poe back again and into the fore, I guess you would say. He went to West Point, and he went to University of Virginia, and apparently it was the second year of the school, and it was such a rough and rowdy place, like a teacher got murdered on campus. It was, yeah, I mean, he was around a lot of, of stuff. Life was very tough in the 19th century. Uh, yeah, and he travels a lot. Like, he gets around quite a bit. He's not just, like, holed up in a shack in Massachusetts somewhere. He He really is traveling you know, all of the, all of New England, he goes, doesn't he go to like Scotland for a bit or something? I don't know about that. I know he lives in New York, in New York for a while. He lives in Baltimore. So he has a lot of connection to Baltimore. You and I, I think we're both in Baltimore at the same time. There's a lot Mm -hmm. of Edgar Allan Poe stuff there. There's a lot here in New York where I live. He, I mean, we could go on and on and on. I mean, he just, he was, the Raven was his first big literary success. He also had a lo- some literary failures. He couldn't hold on to money. He had a drinking problem. He uh, married Virginia Eliza Rowe when uh, she died in 1847. She was 13 when they met. He was 27. People talk about their relationship. Was it even really mm-hmm. romantic or not? He had lost a few women in his life. He lost a girlfriend who was like 15 to cancer. He lost his stepmother. He lost his mother. He also really liked women and thought women should be treated with respect. That was a big thing for yeah. him. And so that also yeah. like made guys kind of tease him. It's when he's per- he people portray him as like weak and pale and sickly. But he when he was ge- young, he was very athletic. It's, it's like what alcohol will do to you. I mean, and and, mm-hmm. be, and perhaps drugs as well. But he he dies in 1849. He's not even 40 years old. There's no real cer- certain way he died. It's probably a bunch of things. It could be tuberculosis. It could be just from alcoholism. Mm-hmm. It could be any consumption, like any kind of things that like, you know, offed people at the time. But he's a legend. And we. this is one of those cases where we understand people can make their entire academic career just talking about Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah. And I think I'm, what I think I'm thinking is, I think it was that he had fame in in the UK while he was still alive. I think he didn't actually go there now that I'm, I'm re- it's sort of coming back to me now. There's a really awesome and the other here's the other thing is that, as Marco said, like he was an odd duck for the time, for sure. Uh, it was never not that, you know, just from the fact that he was he had these two parents who were in the theater and then they're out of the picture really early. And then he's He's uh, taken in by this merchant and his wife, and and he doesn't really live up to that guy's expectations either. And and he has some rather, you know, uh, uh, what we would today call a rather progressive worldview in terms of like in the Victorian era where women's roles were very cut and dried. And, um, you know, he didn't see things that way per se. And yet he has this wife who's way younger than he is. <laughs> um, and... He also, um, one of the ways that he made a living was he wrote for magazines. He did a lot of, um, he did a lot of work as a literary critic. And this, Mm -hmm. um, is kind of what leads to his, the legacy as we know him today, that he, he gave no Fs and would not be bought. (laughs) You want a critic? He will criticize. Yes. He has no problem (laughs) with that. No problem with that. He'll tell you exactly what he thinks is wrong with uh, this book or that book, even if it's written by somebody who considers him, a f- uh, even under, a, 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 yeah. He also has alienated himself from his peers. He's a, ma- he's a massively influential writer, even in his own time, but he's such a difficult guy with like no chill. He has a lot of enemies and there's a really, really awesome drunk history about um, one of his most fervent rivalries with uh, this author that most of us have never heard of named Rufus Wilmot Griswold, um, who was determined, this guy also had no chill. He tried to basically bribe Edgar Allan Poe into giving a book of his a favorable review and Edgar Allan Poe took the money and was honest about what a terrible book it was. And 
Griswold, Griswold, this is how petty he was. Um, after Edgar Allan Poe dies, he he like buys the rights to his life story from the from the family somehow, and he publishes the definitive. Uh, what was for many, many years, the definitive bio of Edgar Allan Poe, which was like, he was a drug addict and he was miserable with women and he was a wimp and he did that done. He was never good for anything and nobody liked him anyway. And, um, and his, he's Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, and so it's really because of this guy that, that um, poor Edgar Poe has the, um, the legacy as a sad gothic uh sad boy who um you know just never made a go of anything but but there's a lot of art you know there's a lot of arguments meant to be to be made to the contrary the circumstances of his death are rather strange there's a lot of speculation about what happened um we do know that after his wife dies, you know, he, that he, as you can even just tell in his work, like there's a lot, there's a lot of themes in his work about oh, the beloved woman has died and, um, and the man who was left behind is driven to madness in one way or another, um, including this story that we're going to talk about today. So um, it's hard to know exactly what happened, but this, but there was also, unfortunately, a phenomenon that that went on at the time, and and I don't think it has a name, but basically, he he's found on the streets of of Baltimore, not quite conscious, coming in and out of consciousness. If I remember correctly, he's wearing like an ill-fitting, like clothes that don't seem to be his own, mm-hmm. right? And what they think happened was that. He, under some circumstance, he was like maybe not entirely sober. Maybe he was like hanging out at a bar or something. And politicians at the time, corrupt politicians at the time, would um, do this thing where they would snatch people off the street, often people who, you know, ply them with alcohol and the alcohol would be drugged. And they would drug these people and force them to vote over and over and over again. So either like string them along with, with extra alcohol or, you know, so, or by force or whatever. There's a theory that perhaps this is what happened to people just not knowing who he was. Um, they drugged him, forced him to vote, changed his clothes, took him to, an, you know, and, and kept doing this until he was so out of it that they just left him on the streets. And somebody, I think somebody recognized him, uh, and tried to get help, but by then, of course, it was it was uh, too late. Um, his last words, uh, according to his the physician that they finally got for him, was "Lord help my poor soul." Oh God, <laughs> so sad. I know. Um, and, and then to add to the mystery, all of the records, the the official records of that, because th- they brought in a doc. Like I said, somebody recognized him. And was like, oh, crap, this is Edgar Allan Poe. Like, he was famous, is what I'm saying. Like, people knew who he was. Um, and they got a doctor, but it was too late. And so there's records of all of this, but the records, unfortunately, were destroyed. So it's super mysterious what actually happened to him. At the time, they said it was like a cerebral, like, fever or something like that. But we, we, we don't really know. And even today, like, there's been... Speculations. Some people have claimed over the years to have a lock of his hair, and they've done DNA tests on it. And every, I mean, it, the cult of Poe is mm-hmm. alive and well. Yeah, <laughs> what I'm saying. Um, but a lot of the the a lot of the the what we think of him, um, and especially like our generation and and our, even our parents' generation, like the the image that we have of Edgar Allan Poe, of the like sad frowny guy in the black suit. Um, a lot of that who just could never make a go of things it comes from his enemy uh, Rufus Griswold <laughs> being petty <laughs> from beyond the grave. So, yeah, I mean, just a really, I think, you know, one, like we, we don't, we in the 21st century don't quite have a grasp of how important he was in his own time. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was so influential on so many writers Um some of the biggest writers that you can, 
you know, that we have today or that we've had between his lifetime and ours, um, he was constantly cited as a, as a major influence. And, and he's a really interesting writer. And I, and reading this story, I hadn't read this story in the many, many years. And I have to say that reading fall of the house of Usher, this, it kind of gave me the giggles a little bit. He's so extra with the, <laughs> like, he's laying it on so thick with the macabre gothic details that I kind of had this image of him like, this guy has to be giggling away as he's, you know, he can't possibly be, nobody is going to be sitting at a desk like, and then it was so, uh, it was so dire. It was covered in mushrooms because nothing else but mushrooms would grow. You know, it's like, it's, it's over amazing. the top. It's really over the top, it, which makes me think that he there's something also of a sense of humor there. I found some humor in this story that I didn't remember being there, um, which I enjoyed. But let's um, let's talk about. Oh gosh, I sorry. I just I just my I was before I moved on. I had a little note here about Griswold in his in that bio calls him evil. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. Um, yeah, so you know, consider the source is all I'm saying. Sometimes right. you have to consider the source. So let's talk about because this is obviously a very enduring story of his. Um, many of his stories are are such a part of our culture that we kind of don't even think about it. Like, like the Raven, of course, Telltale Heart, um, Stephen. You know Stephen Fry. Mm-hmm. Stephen Fry just released, if, you, if you're an Audible member, um, Stephen Fry just released a collection of his favorite spooky stories where he's reading his favorite spooky stories, um, which I imagine must be amazing. I just saw a video of him talking about it. And, um, and he has an Edgar Allan Poe story that I had actually never heard of. It's about a guy who arrives at a place and finds his doppelganger. He finds a double of himself. That's one of the themes that he talks about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This story, uh, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. It, so it was published in 1839 in Burton's Gentleman's Magazine. Les Margo said he would publish, you know, wrote magazine articles when he wasn't working for magazines or doing reviews. It's about a man named Roderick Usher, who he's reaching out to a friend of his. He's been staying in his home forever and ever and ever. They were friends when they were kids. He has a sister, Madeline. And he's saying that I'm so lonely and I'm, I'm in my house. I'm not feeling well. Can you please come and visit me? And it's this loneliness that you really, the isolation and the loneliness that is reaching out. So his friend, a narrator who never gives his name. And so it's the unreliable narrator. Remember that who, who shows up and sees his friend and he's shocked to see the condition that he's in, that he looks so much older than he actually is. He's so pale He's just kind of sitting around in this odd state and like playing his guitar and just saying odd things about his family. I was like, Edgar Allan Poe goes on and like I said, like the layers of uh, it, it, it's so for first of all, you have him approaching the house and he's describing the house and it's crumbling into it has like a moat and it's or a lake yes. you know there's water around the house and it's crumbling away and there's a huge crack in the house that he can see from a great distance away and as i said there's nothing growing but you know the house is covered in mushrooms because it's all like it's all mossy and moldy and gross and um and you know, so he just goes into tremendous detail to to a, a ludicrous degree really and um and, but it's so much fun Oh yeah, and then, yeah. He, he arrives. He and before you meet the friend, um, he describes the friend as he remembered him in their youth, and and his friend as he remembers him was, of course, like the most dashing, most fun loving, um, you know, handsome golden boy of the summer. And um, and then he arrives, and he is just this, as Margot says, this just like gaunt, pale, uh, just a not even a husk of what he used to be. An usher, I'm sorry, he doesn't have a butler with him in this, right? It's just no, in, in the story. No, it's just the sister and the brother. Right. And um, and this this has made me giggle. I mean, the, the whole thing was making me giggle the whole time. This cracked me up. So the brother says, I mean, the, yeah, Roderick, who is our the, the brother in, of the, the Roderick Usher, 
Roderick says to his friend, our unnamed, he says, oh, yes, you know, I'm so lonely. I'm so plagued with loneliness and my sister is not well and I haven't been well. And and I've, I've just gotten to the point where where uh, oh, he paints. He's like everything, you know, everything hurts my eyes and I can't stand the sound of music. Everything hurts my eyes. But I have these paintings here that I made um, and I can't stand any kind of noise. I can't I can't enjoy any kind of music except the guitar. I played some, I uh, wrote some songs for the guitar. Would you like to hear them? Here they go. <laughs> and he plays this like awful discordant guitar. Like you really, he can't stand any music, but apparently his own, um, which is terrible. <laughs> He's playing the guitar and the friends just like humoring him. Like, Oh yeah. Great song, Rod. Um, <laughs> what else is going and, on? Yeah. The love these paintings. So you'd be keeping yourself busy. That's good. Um, and so, yeah, Roderick is just, is, it's like the bummer of all time. He's, nothing's working out for him. He doesn't even want to leave his house anymore. He's stuck in the house with his sister. The sister is even weirder. <laughs> yeah, they're twins. And she, they're twins, of and, course. And she's in a spooky. cataleptic trance. So she, every occasionally, she just, just falls. And checks just, out. Yeah, checks out. Does, yeah. can't speak, can't do anything. And yeah. they're the only remaining members of their family. And then there's a whole thing yes. about all the people in the family and, and what they've done and why yeah. why they are alone with each other. This house is just falling apart. Everything, it just smells musty. It's going <laughs> to fall apart. There's there's a lake. There's like storms outside. They think it's going to, you know, an electrical fire or the lightning like, will happen. Maybe and the house will fire. finally fall down. Right. <laughs> And the narrator says, you know, he, he meets all this and he's like, what the heck is going on? Madeline just dies. And Roderick tells him. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a weird thing that Madeline. So Madeline is Madeline, as I say, even weirder than her brother. She just kind of like wanders into the room and she kind of doesn't seem to know where she is. She wanders in the room. She talks to Roderick. Roderick she wanders away. She's in a cataleptic trance. Um, okay. And, but at no point whatsoever. So she lives, she supposedly lives in this house, the crumbling family house alone with her twin brother and no other contact with the outside world. She wanders into the room. There's a whole other guy there. She never acknowledges him. Never, never looks at him, never talks to him. Um, it, it just as though he's not even there. And you, the reader, are like, okay. And at no point does our narrator be like, well, it was great to see you, Rod, Maddie. Um, sorry, I can't stay. Got to go back home to, to the Boston. wife, the old ball yeah. and chain. You know how that is. <laughs> no. He's like, nope, nope. He's, he's like, I got, I just, wow, this is real bad. Oh, gosh, it's even worse than I thought. So he's hanging out at this house, this crumbling house with these bizarre twins. And one day, Roderick, they, they get up in the morning and Roderick's like, oh, oh, friend, good morning. Um, bad news, uh, sister died. She's, she's dead now. And um, oh, yeah, I got to bury her. I'm going to need you to help me with that. Because people used to take bodies at the morgue and medical schools would steal the bodies. Yeah, just like with the voting thing. This was a real thing that actually happened. Right. Like, so. So a reader reading this at the time would not find that that part of the story so strange. Like, oh, okay, yeah, the the um, he's trying to not have her body stolen and um, carved up by doctors, <laughs> right? So <laughs> for, he, for science sake, so he wants to keep her in the house. And and there are wakes, like Catholic wakes. And I know in my family, yes. they would be in the home in the front room. Oh, that was a very normal thing. Yeah, yeah. there's plenty of parts of the world where that is a totally normal thing. Yeah. Yeah. So he, so he, he says we need to, to bury, we need to put her in her coffin and bury her in the basement with the rest of the family because I don't want the doctors. And he's like, are we sure she's dead? But okay. Cause she yeah. seems dead. <laughs> so our narrator's That's... like, she, she's, yeah. Okay. But you know, she kind of looks, she kind of looks okay. It's and, like a... and you did say she has these catale catalepsy trances and, and I mean, He's like, listen, like Rod, just hear me out. Like her, her cheeks are kind of rosy. I mean, they she, 
and she she really kind of seems like maybe this isn't actually are you sure and rod rod's like yeah no this is definitely no, definitely dead dead, dead. dead. Yeah. gotta gotta dead, dead, nail, dead. nail it and, shut uh, Yep, no time to no time to think twice. Let's just get her down in the dungeon, and uh, yeah, just you just grab that end, uh, friend, and we'll, <laughs> we'll just take her down to the dungeon. And uh, and the friend's like, okay, all right, okay. And they take. The, I mean, I'm telling you, I was just giggling the entire time. They take they take Madeline in the coffin. These two men in a leaden coffin somehow are man- managing to carry that with a whole person in it down into the family dungeon uh, of the house of Usher, which is crumbling all around them. And he keeps saying that the and, house is alive. Like the, the yes. house is a spirit. The house is mad. The house is upset. The house is like yes. enveloping him. The house, the house, the house. And so this poor narrator is like, he gets stuck doing this job of like burying the sister. And then they're keeping themselves company for a couple of weeks while she's there. So they read from books to one another Yes. As also yeah. by he's talking about the lake is going on fire and there's storms outside yeah. and it just gets. And our narrator's like, hey, how about we read this book? This scary book. <laughs> That's a great idea. Right. And they're talking about knights and dragons and things like that. And yeah. then at one point they start to hear the house is making these wailing sounds and yeah. they don't know if it's from the book. They don't know if it's from the storm, but. Turns out it's from Madeline. She comes out of her, she busts out of her coffin covered in blood because she had a bust, you know, burst out of this wooden coffin. And then she comes into the room and she sees her brother and he sees her all covered in blood. He freaks out so badly that he just dies on the spot. And then she dies. dies Right. Right. And then she dies on top of him. And this narrator like just runs out of the house. Like finally yeah. it's like, this like, is like, yeah, this is I think my... we're done here. And then yeah. the house crumbles in on itself <laughs> into the lake. Yeah. 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 It's a great it really ghost kind story. Of, it really kind of, it makes me think of like how in this day and age, like you'll get a, you'll get a, a, a friend request on Facebook from somebody you haven't talked to since middle school. You know, that's basically what happened to this guy is, you know, he got a, he got yeah. a friend request. He just like a, goes, oh. old school chum. He's and like, this is like, what happened. I got a couple of weeks off. I'll go visit my buddy, make sure he's okay. Cause we were good friends at one time. They were young and, and he just, just to see him in all this decay and the, and surrounded by decay and death. And then ultimately death happens. And then he's, he pieces out. He's like, I gotta go. So yeah, that's the story. It's great. I think it's, it's fun. It's so fun. And you could get versions read fun. by Vincent Price, uh, Christopher Lee. There's a lot of people who, if you go on YouTube, there's you a lot of find. good ones out there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a good spooky story, you know, for Halloween, it makes for good fodder. Mm-hmm. This was also like it's gothic literature that didn't exist yet. I mean, he's like one of mm, the true. precursors of that, yeah. and so it, you know, you would get like Dickens and other people later on who would add some fantastical elements to things. Mary Shelley, the but this is it was truly you know, he wrote mysteries also, and he he was a very gifted writer, supposedly like very full of himself. Why wouldn't he be? He was he was special and he and it's a fun story. And it's been remade many, many, many times. I oh, went down so the YouTube times. rabbit no, hole. Absolutely. We didn't we, once again, we're not talking about the Netflix series because it's eight episodes and it just happened. And I don't know if Margo, I don't know if you would want to watch it or not. It's it's not even it's not gory. Mm-hmm. But it's intense and scary. Yes. I, I was saying that my husband's been watching it and I've been in the other room thinking like, ooh. Um, but I mean, there was a silent movie version of it. I mean, this is this a, it's a story that has really, I can imagine like reading this in a magazine and just being riveted. Yeah. And, and it's something that's influenced so many other writers later on. Um, and yeah, it's just super good. I'm glad we looked at it again. Cause last time we did the Raven, which is a poem, of course. Um, but I, I think, uh, I really loved all of the the tremendous uh, at, at times absolutely hilarious detail that he goes to in in describing the house and really making the house a character and 
Um, and it just like it, it's all about the description. Because, I mean, if you really look at it, very little happens. He, he gets a letter, says, hey, come visit me. He goes and visits his friend. Friend's not well. Sister dies. Uh, they bury the sister. She turns out is not dead. And she busts out. And the brother dies from fright. The end. And um, it's all about... It's all about the way everything looks and sounds, the, all the various like details of the architecture and the, 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 the way that Roderick, his physical appearance and everything. Um, yeah, I really, I really enjoyed it. And, um, and I don't think, I don't think I'd ever seen this film. I think I'd only seen, I've only seen I've, some of those Poe Corman mm-hmm. films. Um, and the Raven one that we talked about before is absolutely ludicrous. It is, it's hilarious. It's um, fun. It's very fun. It has zero to do with <laughs> <laughs> really nothing. Um, but this movie, this movie is the first of the, of the, um, the Corman Poe, uh, series. And, um, and I think he's really trying to kind of stay true to it, but but we'll talk we'll talk about that in a second. Is there anything else you want to say about this story? I say like, let's go to the film. I, I kind of want to okay. see. I did see, uh, by the way, <laughs> part of a 1981 TV version, and it was with Robert Hayes and Charlene Tilton. Oh yeah, I can't believe you found that. It, th- like it was only like the first 15 minutes I could find, but uh, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so this is. Uh, I love Roger Corman. I mean, just Me too. <laughs> these, these movies are great. So this is the original 1960 trailer for House of Usher. Only the incomparable genius of Edgar Allan Poe could knit them so closely together. The burning passions of the purest of loves. The deadly passions of the madly prurient. Madeline, you're leaving this house with me tomorrow. Only I could. For hundreds of years, evil thoughts and evil deeds have been committed within these walls. The house itself is evil now. Here they all are. Ushers. This is monstrous. It waits for me, because very soon I shall be dead. Oh, Madeline, come away with me now. You buried your own sister alive? I did. But she's dead now. The master hand of the macabre creates its masterpiece. Screenwriter today is Richard Matheson, who we've talked about in the past. He wrote I Am Legend, which we covered with uh, Will Smith, who's in the news lately. It's where his wife is. <laughs> <Ex-wife>. <laughs> anyway, Roger Corman is our director. He was known for, he's still with us, he's known for schlocky stuff. I mean, he, he doesn't yeah. spend a lot of money 
on his movies, but he has a lot of fun making them. He's been, a, a, he's helped so many directors and writers and costume makers and all kinds of people. He was their big break into show business. And he really lets people kind of run wild, do their thing. This is mm-hmm. one of, this is his first collaboration with Vincent Price, 1960 color film. And we have Vincent Price at his most Vincent Priceiest. I mean, oh, amazing. We, okay, we've talked. Well, we talked about it when we talked about the Raven. Of course, we you, you and I. For those of you who are new, we adore Vincent Price. Mm-hmm. I just love that man. Um, he's. I, I think this uh, this House of Usher, or sometimes as I said before, it's called the Fall of the House of Usher. It's it, you might find it under either one. It was pretty successful, and um, it's nineteen sixty. He's like in his 40s at this point. And so he's had quite a, a film career and a stage career mm-hmm. um, at this point. And he already is, he's quite tall. Yes. Uh, and he has that very distinct and distinguished uh, way of speaking, which is in his earlier movies, you know, he's this kind of sometimes the dashing leading man, often the villain of the piece, often yes. like the handsome, the handsome villain. And, um, it t- evolves over time to become, and I think partly be- just because of that voice, he he just becomes um, linked for most of his legacy with this kind of spooky, gothic, horror kind of genre, which he does better than anybody else. Believe me, sir, I bear you no malice. Were things otherwise, I should welcome you into our family joyously. But under the circumstances, it is quite impossible. Why do you assume that that you are dying? There are many reasons. Pray give me one, then. Madeline and I are like figures of fine glass. The slightest touch and we may shatter. Both of us suffer from a morbid acuteness of the senses. Mine is the worse for having existed the longer, but both of us are afflicted with it. Any sort of food more exotic than the most pallid mash is unendurable to my taste buds. Any sort of garment other than the softest is agony to my flesh. My eyes are tormented by all but the faintest illumination Odors assail me constantly, and as I've said, sounds of any degree whatsoever inspire me with terror. That's why your servant asked me to remove my boots. Yes, and even so I could hear you coming. Every footstep, every rustle of your clothes, I could hear your horse approaching. Hear the clatter of its hooves across the courtyard, your knock. The grating of the door bolt was like a sword stroke to my ears. I can hear the scratch of rat claws within the stone wall. Mr. Winthrop, three quarters of my family have fallen into madness, and in their madness have acquired a a superhuman strength so that it took the power of many to subdue them. Do you not exaggerate, sir? Perhaps there have been in your family certain peculiarities of temperament. Peculiarities of temperament? How diplomatically you put it. Peculiarities of temperament. And yeah, I agree. I think his... Um, because the 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 Raven is just silly and camp and fun. This one is a little. It's a some of that. There's touches of that for sure. And he's playing it up. For, he's able to do that. He's able to be camp, but also delivering the character to you, mm-hmm. uh, which I think is what is so awesome about him. But um, he has gone on an extreme diet. Right. And bleached his hair blonde. Yep. (laughs) Stayed out of the sun. Yep. Stayed out of the sun. And I am here for it. Yeah. He's committed. I mean, we also like 
you and I are kids of the 70s and 80s. Like he was a very famous episode of the Brady Bunch where they had went to Hawaii, the tiki doll. Yeah. <laughs> also, he's uh, in Michael Jackson's Thriller. He's the one that does the voice when they do that spooky passage in that song. I mean, he's known for this stuff. And he comes into play. Uh, he's playing opposite Mark Damon and Myrna Fahey. And Myrna Fahey had done a bunch of shows in the 60s. She was on Batman. Yeah, and TV a lot. A, yeah. a lot of TV. She unfortunately passed away very young uh, to lung cancer. And then there's Harry Ellerby, who plays the old butler of the house, the, the house. Yeah. And so Matt, Mark, once Mark, again, Damon. This Mark Damon, and uh, uh, there's a bunch of places that say he talks with a Brooklynese accent. He's actually from Chicago, but he, yeah, he doesn't sound Brooklyn. To no, me I all. know that. I know that personally. I, yeah. yeah. But he, but he plays Mark, who shows up at the house because he says, Madeline, his girlfriend, sent him a note, said, please come get me. I'm not feeling well. He shows up at the house and then he's Harry Ellerby greets him and he says, you have to let me in. And he goes, nope, you can't come in. The sister's sick. Nobody's allowed in. He's like, but yeah. I'm her fiance. Uh, he's, and he's kind of like, hmm, I don't know about that. But he lets he he at sometimes he listens to the rules and sometimes he's like, no, no, no you got to let me in. So he comes in and then he meets. Vincent Price, who's like a head taller than him with the blonde he's, hair. He's a head taller than everybody in everybody this film. Everybody in well, this piece. Which the, but the stat, I really loved the opening of the movie. Again, Roger Corman, as Margot said, he didn't like to uh, he, he didn't like to splash the cash around. No uh, David Fincher, he. No, no, no. <laughs> um but but nevertheless, the movie opens with our our uh Mark. Um who is our uh, Mark Damon, who is, what's his real name? What's his name in the movie? The character's name? Philip uh, Winthrop. Oh, yes. Philip Winthrop. Winthrop. <laughs> so we, we the, the movie it's a opens fancy with pants Philip, name. Philip Winthrop looking very dashing, very, very um, uh, pomade, pomaded. Oh, the hair um, is yes. gorgeous. That is yes, very it's, Elvis it's, hair. It's like you can see yourself in it. It's just good. the beautiful pompadour. And he is on horseback and he's riding through a desolate landscape. So Roger Corman, in true Roger Corman fashion, had heard about a, a fire. There was a fire in the Hollywood Hills um, like a day or two before. It was still smoldering. And Roger's like, that's perfect for the beginning of the movie. Let's go. And they, so there they are. He's Mark Damon's on horseback riding through a real fire scene in the real Hollywood Hills. And then he looks off in the distance, and there in the distance is the House of Usher, which doesn't look anything like a matte painting. It, it, no, I'm sure it's very real. Um, no, it's like it literally looks like my daughter painted it on cardboard. <laughs> it's just, and my daughter can paint, but um, but you know, it looks like cardboard. <laughs> I'm sorry, like all the sets look like cardboard. So he's he's like looking at this cardboard mansion. Um, in the distance and he rides up like Margot says and knocks on the door and the butler opens the door the butler who is not, does not at all aged up when, with the makeup um, <laughs> the butler it must be the same age as Mark Damon because yeah that's not right? um, yeah it's like they put baby powder in the wigs and but, that, that's yeah, the their aging wig process wig practically got like powder powder clouds coming up off of it Larry, Larry Ellerby or Harry Ellerby I'm sorry um, as uh, what's his name? Bristol. Bristol. <laughs> and um, it, the whole thing, like like when Roderick uh, uses the door knocker, it's like the whole set shape. <laughs> 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 oh, it's so awesome. Um, uh, yeah. Harry Ellerby was uh, he was another one that was like on TV. He was on he was in everything, you know. This was an era of like your Batman, your Perry Mason. Um, there was a lot of gun TV smoke. going on. There was a lot gun smoke. Oh, yeah, all the Westerns. And so a lot of these actors, um, Mark Damon and uh, Harry Ellerby and um, who's our Myrna, who's our Myrna Mer Fahey. Myrna. Yeah, Myrna. So they were working, you know, people who were going to see this movie would have known, well, known these actors from television for sure. And I think they're doing a pretty good job, I actually. Oh, yeah. I think I mean, Hel Harry Ellerby, the makeup is horrific, but he's doing a good job. Like his acting, I think, is very good. And he's he's um, he's giving you. He's giving you very like um, very Batman's Alfred. 
Yes. Knows all the secrets, cares about the family, but also wants what's best for everybody and like walking that tightrope. And um, he oddly asks Mark, he invites Mark Damon in, Phil Winthrop in and um, in, in demands that he remove his boots. <laughs> and he's like, okay. Um, and he's, and then he, he, he comes back with a pair of slippers for the guy to wear. And uh, he's like, okay. He insists, Philip Winthrop insists on um, being shown to Madeline's brother to, to get to the bottom of what has happened to his fiance um, and what can he do to help. And, and that, yeah, so that's when we meet Vincent Price. I mean, this first scene with Vincent Price. Mr. Winthrop? Uh, no, thank you. My dear. You haven't touched a thing, Madeline. Don't you think that crack in the wall should be repaired? For future generations of ushers. For Madeline's safety. It was probably the trembling of the house which caused that chandelier to fall. Do you really think so? Have you a better explanation? <clears throat> While I was riding here, I noticed a singular lack of vegetation in the area. Is there something wrong with the soil? The soil? Yes, of course. Frederick, please. As you will. How do things go in Boston, Philip? Everyone asks for you. Oh, do they? They miss you, Madeline. We all miss you. I could just watch this first scene over and over again. It is so good. He gives all these speeches. He's like, don't talk too loud. I can't wear clothes that are rough on my skin. I can't eat this. I can't do that. I mean, it's this whole, like, a delicate flower thing. But he's this very tall man that looks like pretty, doesn't look emaciated. I mean, he's supposed to be emaciated and, and sickly and... But there's always like kind of a glean in his eye or something because it's Vincent Price. But he also delivers his lines so well because he t he treats the material like it's real, which is what you're supposed to do when you're an actor. You have to just treat the situation as real. So on the one hand, like she like you were saying, he's you know talking about all these things. But on the other hand, there is sort of this glint in his eye, like he knows this is camp, that he knows this is kind of silly. Um, and then Mark Damon is sort of just going with it. And it's like, well, I demand to see my fiance. What is wrong with her? And why, you know. Yeah. He's like, shh, not so loud. <laughs> Please. <laughs> my ears. <laughs> Please. And then he's just playing his little mandolin, you know, as he's, it's, it's adorable. It's so awesome. I just love it so much. Yeah. He just, he, he he's just such a master. As you say, like he's, I am getting that full character, but I'm also getting Vincent Price is in on the joke with me. Yes. So he does meet Madeline and, and, and Madeline is like, I don't know, I'm, I'm not feeling well. They tell me I should stay here. And he wants to take her away, but he realizes this is not going to be easy because her brother is saying, no, she's got to be, she's not feeling well. She has to stay here. This is her home. Madeline then goes, do you want to go to the basement and see where everybody's buried? He's like, all right. So she takes him to the basement. And this is when I think young Frankenstein definitely like did a thing with a, I ain't got nobody. Because <laughs> he's just, this is, this is my father. This is my mother. This is my grandmother. They're all like buried. <laughs> They're all like marked there. And They're he's, all just chilling down And he's the just kind of like, who's this kooky chick that I'm going to marry? Like, what is going on here? And then she falls into catalepsy so that she just look like, and so they all explain and like, yeah, sometimes she just kind of knocks out like that. You have to just understand. The next morning, he comes into the kitchen and asks Bristol, hey, I'd like to take some breakfast up to my fiance. What do you got? And he's like, we got some gruel. And he's like, all right, gruel for both of us. And it's this <laughs> cauldron that's like boiling hot. 
<laughs> he's going to get burned by it. But he goes up to his sister and he, she's still, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting lost to the story now. Like he, she appears a, to be dead, but. There, there's a scene where he, he's looking for her and she's lying on her bed. I don't know. On her bed or a table or I don't know some weird place, and um, and Bristol's like, no, don't wake her up because she'll be all freaked out, and and um, and that's when we learn that she walks in her sleep and she's got catalepsy. Also, like, there's this all this weird stuff that's happening in the house. Like, the house is constantly making noises, um, constantly crumbling around them. Vincent Price doesn't seem to notice or care, and um, so we have these several scenes where, um. The house, the house appears to be attacking Mark Damon. Um, he he is walking in the Great Hall, and a and a, a chandelier like very nearly kills him. Um, very dangerous cardboard chandelier. The, the and, also the uh, ra- the railing that just disappears the, from the his band, hands the, at the sawdust. He's go- yes, he's going downstairs, and the um, the banister like falls out from under him, and. Um, He's like, whoa. And then, yeah, when he's like in the kitchen getting the gruel, the pot starts like inching over to close to where he is. And Bristol's like, sir. Uh, and says, so there's all these things about like, is the house haunted? What's going on? Um, and, and, the, and it's just, and it gets increasingly worse. It's uh, it, to the point that, that Philip Winthrop asks Bristol, the, the bachelor about it. And, and Bristol's like, oh, you know, it's just an old house. <laughs> it's just settling. <laughs> it's just and you're like, settling. okay. Yeah. And as he, and he's looking, he's constantly looking and he sees the big crack in the house and there's like always like dust crumbling and clearly there's like some stuff going on. Uh, but anyway, yeah, Madeline, Madeline goes back and forth. Like at the, sometimes she's like, yes, take me away from here. And other times she's like, no, I can't possibly leave. Um, you need to understand, like, this is my destiny kind of thing. And and there also seems to be a secret between herself and her brother, uh, Vincent Price. So there are these moments where Roderick is about to say something and Madeline stops him. Um, and she, you know, so you get the impression as the movie goes on that she... You you don't know what's wrong with her, but something there is something definitely wrong. Um, she seems to want to escape, um, but she also seems afraid to escape. Um, she also seems to not really think that things are going to work out if she does escape. Um, but Philip Winthrop is totally oblivious to all, all he is. I don't get what he sees in this chick. I'll be honest. She's um, pretty, but she's, she's got pretty. baggage, man. I mean, <laughs> yeah, she's not going to be someone that's going to host dinner parties and stuff like that for you. Like, what she's- is? Yeah, what are your plus? And also, like, she's so delicate; she can't do this. She can only eat grill. How did she go to Boston? I don't get that part. No, but um, but okay, whatever. The point is, both Madeline and Roderick and Bristol, for that matter, are giving Philip Winthrop every possible off ramp that they could possibly give him and he is like nope i'm gonna take this chick and ride away from this place and you're like okay i'm gonna rescue her okay all right "Mm." okay and i'm like okay then then mr winthrop this kind of seems like this is a little more about you than it is about her just saying you know like maybe we need to like think about think about uh maybe some unresolved issues of your own (laughs) that you haven't you haven't dealt with um we have oh let's talk about the paintings i love the paintings by the way i think they're really cool there's but there's paintings all around the house that seem to be following them like the eyes seem to be following them the the art direction is really fun in this house and did you read that the cinematographer is floyd crosby that's David Crosby's father from Crosby, Stills, and Nash. I know. No relation to Bing. No relation but, to Bing, but um, yeah. That, but yes, related to um, <laughs> David Crosby. The paintings are by um, a fascinating artist um, named Bert Schoenberg, um, who was, he was kind of like a... Um, oh, a character in uh, around Hollywood at the time. 
and or around Los Angeles, I should say, the greater, greater Los Angeles at the time. And he was known for these very kind of fantastical paintings. He and some friends ran um, a famous slash notorious coffee house. Again, this is the era of coffee houses in the 50s and 60s um, in Long Beach, I think it was, called Cafe Frankenstein. Oh, my goodness. I don't know about <laughs> this. Yeah, and he had done this um, stained glass window. You can, it looks very much like the paintings in this movie, but of Frankenstein's monster. And um, the community was outraged and tried to have it removed. He um, he was selected um, because of his particular artistic style and kookiness. He was selected by this doctor at, I think it was UCLA, to participate in the famous slash infamous LSD experiments. They wanted to see what impact LSD would have on a quote unquote creative mind. Like, would it change his, um, his, uh, the nature of his work, which he said that it did. Bert Schoenberg said that it did. Um, I saw something somewhere where, um, <laughs> of all people, uh, Sally Kellerman talking about that she she was in love with him. I don't think they had a relationship, but they had a friendship and um and she was she was in love with him and I don't think it went anywhere. But um she but was yeah, kooky. He's a, she was also very kooky. Um so yeah he's definitely this um known artist, unusual kind of kind of like the um the keen paintings. The keen paintings, thank you. Like a cross between that and um, Lucian Freud that we talked about when we talked about the picture of Dorian Gray. So kind of like mm -hmm. between those two worlds. Uh, but he was definitely like a guy about town that Roger Corman, I'm sure, would have known and known about. And like, oh, that guy makes those creepy paintings. Like, he'd be perfect. Let's get him. And so um, so those are his paintings. They're, they're excellent paintings. I love them. I, want, I bet yeah. they're worth a fortune now. Didn't Vincent Price also paint? Am I remembering that correctly? Or he just collected everything. Paintings? He was so amazing. He really was. I, we, we posted pictures of him. Like he was so handsome when he was young. We, he's been a lot of, we, you and I cover a lot of film noir. He was in a lot of film noir films in the thirties and forties. He did a lot of stage work. And then this is around the part of his career. Like Margot said, he switched more towards horror, horror films. And a lot of his cohorts did this, his friends at the time. Um, talking about Joan Crawford. And Joan Crawford did. Betty Davis yeah. did. You know, it's it's a genre that does respect, like, actors. You, know, you don't have to be, you know, perfect and young. You could just, you know, but if you're a good actor, we should also say R.I.P. to Piper Laurie, who passed away yesterday. We talked about Carrie in the past. And she was also a phenomenal actor who really did well in horror. So he, so let's just let, let's just move it along. So Madeline is dead-ish. They <laughs> same thing like, oh, look, Madeline's dead. Got to got to bury her. Um, and I love and it's so hilarious. You know, they have the scene where she's in the coffin and she's looking absolutely lifelike and beautiful. And um, Vincent Price is like, OK, time to put her in the dungeon, slams it shut. <laughs> and, then carry it down the and, and so, yeah, they put her in the in the crypt, uh, this nightmare sequence that that Philip Winthrop has this nightmare about. Uh, because Vincent Price's character, Roderick, has told him about all of the evil, and this is all just in the movie, it's not in the book at all, all of the evil ancestors. He kind of walks them through this wonderful gallery of paintings by Bert Schoenberg, and like, this ancestor was a murderer, and that yes. ancestor was a human trafficker, and they were all these horrible people, and and um, they all have this madness, and so, you know, they he, he and Madeline have holed themselves up in this house, partly because of their affliction about the senses is extra sensory stuff, but, um, but also to protect the greater world from the evil of their bloodline. And that was why, you know, she couldn't marry uh, Philip Winthrop. But then we have the, you know, the noises, the creaking, the shrieking, the crumbling of the house and all of that part, which is straight out of the story. And, um, and Philip Winthrop con uh, confronts Roderick who admits, yes, Madeline was a, uh, only cataleptic, not actually dead, but you know, it was going to happen sooner or later. So we might and as I well just take care of someone to help yeah. me do this. Basically, yeah. like, it I was helpful. Our hands. Yeah. You know, Bristol wasn't going to help me get that thing down the stairs. So, uh, and then we Bristol see this says, how long have you been here, sir? And he says 60 years and he just stares at him. I'm like, yeah, it looks like he's just 
covered in baby powder like all yeah. over himself. Like what? But anyway, yeah, he he lets it. He get get the cats out of the bag, and that's when that she's actually cataleptic cat, and has catalepsy. So he rips open the coffin, and then she takes off, and then she's basically like chasing them around the house. <laughs> She and it's great. I mean, she's really yeah. like ah. She's doing a great job. She's, she's wonderful. Really great in this. I, I think love she's her fantastic in this. Yes. in this. And then she confronts her brother and she strangles him. And then, uh, then the house all of a sudden is like up in flames. And apparently there was a barn that someone was going to burn down. Once again, Hollywood Hills. And Roger Corman like, that's perfect. Let's go. Can I film it? And they're like, yeah, all right. So he films it and then keeps that film and then uses that film in several pictures and was shocked to find out that people are like, is that the same film you used like in that thing and that thing? And he was like shocked, like, oh, what? It's a fire. It's just a fire. Like (laughs) fire is fire. (laughs) But the house, the house is up in flames. Philip, I'm sorry, uh, Mark Damon gets away. Philip Winthrop gets away. But that's when he can see in the distance, like the house is just crumbling in on itself. The lake is on fire. The, the... It's literally like a piece of cardboard taped to a, pl- a popsicle stick. That's like somebody's like gradually lowering in the frame. <laughs> it's, so, it's so cheesy. It's, it's, I love it. I it's love awesome. Every second of it. It's awesome. And then he's leaving and then they have like a couplet of Edgar Allan Poe at the very end. And it's 90 minutes it's fun. I love it. It's great. I love it. Vincent Price gives some great speeches that are, I, I just, he could read the phone, like one of those, he could read the phone book and I would just yes. be like, fascinating. I'm buying it. I'm buying, I'm buying it. it. Um, Whatever you're selling, I'm buying. I read some stuff about like it getting an X rating. I saw that too. And I couldn't Why? figure out exactly because it's around the world. Like in Spain, they didn't see it for years. I'm not sure if it's just there's no nudity. If you're wondering, there's if you've no never cursing. Seen this film. There's, no, the nudity. blood is like it's ketchup literally packets. red paint. Yeah, it's, ketchup, yeah, ketchup packets and red paint, and that's it. It's not. There's no sex. No, it's not. He barely kisses her. He barely kisses her. I guess it's just because it's the macabre, and I guess I guess. But there's honestly, no swearing. You could show this to your kids and they would think it was kind of funny. I mean, they would not be scared. It's hilarious. Yeah. There's, there's no even like, um, nobody's knifing anybody. Like there's nothing. No, I don't get it. Yeah. I, I don't either. I, I'm not quite sure, uh, but I'm glad that it exists. I mean, and also it was preserved in 2005 in the uh, United States National Film Registry for being culturally significant. Yeah. I think I think it's a – first of all, I totally get why after making this so, – so as we said before, this is the first in a series of – again, I think it's eight films um, that what's called the Poe po Corman or Corman Poe series um, – uh, films that were inspired by the works of Edgar Allan Poe. But I, I could totally see why after making this one, people would be like, oh, we need w- way more of this, please. Please. Um, where has this been all our lives? Because this is awesome. And um, and I think it's a worthy interpretation mm-hmm. of this story. It's, it's just like the original story. It's very extra. Like we've got... Um, you have the the wonderful character of Bristol, the um, the butler who is a digician. Love him, and um, I even love his terrible makeup. I love like all of the candles are red candles for some reason, but we're not ever going to talk about like why are we? Why do we all have red candles? Is One that a thing? Candle left. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's so good. It's wonderful. The score is good. The paintings are amazing. Um, it is very, it is all the same kind of, um, it's very much in the spirit, I think, of the original story. And I I like the device of having Philip Winthrop, having him have a name, because mm-hmm. it's fun to say Philip Winthrop, of course. Um, and, um, and I like that that's his, he has this kind of, because that is the one thing when you're reading the original story where, as I said, you're like, dude, why are you hanging out with this guy? Like you could totally just be like, Oh, I look at the time. Yeah, I exactly. totally forgot, you know? 
And but but in the movie we have he has this kind of driving thing of wanting to get his fiance out of there that that's what's keeping him there and that kind of makes a little more sense mm-hmm. um, as to why he's not just like running out of the place. Um, so I like it. I, I think that's I think the devices of that are good and um, it, it's I, it's so much fun. It is so much fun. I love it. Yeah, it was great. It's great. Oh, so book versus movie. Ooh. Yeah, that's tough, right? Oh, that is a toughie. You know, okay, because Edgar Allen, I mean, uh, uh, Vincent Price, mm-hmm. Vincent Price, I- I'm going to tie it. I'm going to give it a tie. I'll do both, the same. They're both so good, and they're both such great fun, perfect for this time of year. Um, yeah, you could totally, I-, I think you could watch this with your, maybe not tiny kids, but, you know, um, certainly like... 10, 12 and up? Oh, yeah. Yeah, right? They're not going to freak out. No, I watched it as a very small child because it was on uh, KTLA all the time every every October. Um, all of those movies were always on TV in October in uh, Southern California. So I saw it from a very young age. And, um, but I, you know, I didn't, I did not find it as funny as I find it today. <laughs> but in a delightful way. Oh, it's wonderful. It's yeah. so, he's just... Oh, Vincent Price. He's so you and I love like how for the entire film he's you get like his increasing distress, agony, rage, um all of the most extreme emotions, but very quietly. Cause he can't talk above a whisper really. <laughs> and and because otherwise it's too, you know, his, oh, my ears and I'm too sensitive. And, you know, and, and whenever Mark Damon even slightly raises his voice, Vincent Price is wincing Ooh. and flinching. Oh, it's wonderful. It's, it's fun. It's super fun. It's so good. Yeah. All right. So, so highly recommend. Yes. And let's talk about what we're doing next. I'm excited for this one, too. The next one we're going to cover is I Know What You Did Last Summer. It's a Lois Duncan novel. It came out in the early 1970s. And we're going to pair it with the 1997 movie with Jennifer Love Hewitt and co. It's going to be fun. <laughs> and then after that, we're covering Misery, if you're keeping up with us. And we have a special guest joining us for Misery. That's going to be really fun. This has been just so much. I love this. I love October. I love October. It send, makes me so happy. So please send us your suggestions. Uh, like at all those places I mentioned at the top of the show, once again, our email is book versus movie podcast, spelled it all out at gmail.com. Marco, where can they find you? You can find me online at coloniabook.com and all of my social media callouts are at She's Nacho Mama. And where can they find you? You can find me at Brooklyn Margo for Blue Sky, for Twitter, and also on TikTok. And then... I, yeah, I'm at Brooklyn Fitchick on Instagram and threads, and that's the name of my site. Okay, everyone, we'll be back next week, next week, excuse me, with I Know What You Did Last Summer. Thank you so much for listening to the Book vs. Movie Podcast. We are a part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more podcasts you will love at frolic.media forward slash podcasts. We follow the hashtags Lady Pod Squad and Potter and Family. If you want to support the show, you can go to our Patreon page, go to P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and look for Book vs. Movie Podcast. We have a basic Facebook page, but we also have a private Facebook group. Go to Facebook and type in Book vs. Movie Podcast group if you want to join that. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Book vs. Movie. Spell all those words out. If you'd like to send us an email, it's Book vs. Movie Podcast. Spell that all out at gmail.com. You can follow Margot D at Brooklyn Fit Chick on social media and Margot P at She's Nacho Mama. Thanks so much again for checking out our show and we'll be back soon with a new episode.